Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Elliot Wolf. You have the preface that I put together for this program. Um, I diced it up a little bit uh, to make it move along, but all the words are here. Art illuminates the human condition, both in process and in product, and can make visible the pain of separation, death, grief, and loss. That's a direct quote from Stephen Lynn's introduction to the beautiful sadness, a symphonic poem of love and death. We are all aware of how artists portray the sadness of death. Prior to seeing Stephen's compelling symphonic poem, I want to illustrate three enduring examples of the interweaving of death and beauty, a beauty rendered by the creativity of the artist. <coughs> Antigone, Sophocles, 442 BCE. Creon, king of Thebes. Ateocles, who has fallen fighting for our city, in all renown of arms, shall be entombed and crowned with every right that follows the noblest dead to their rest. But for his brother, <coughs> Polynices, who came back from exile and sought to consume utterly with fire the city of his fathers and the shrines of his fathers gods, it hath been proclaimed to our people that none shall grace him with lament, but leave him unburied, a corpse, for birds and dogs to eat a ghastly sight of shame. Guard, the corpse, someone had just given it burial and gone away after sprinkling thirsty dust on the flesh with such other rites as piety enjoins. Antigone, not through dread of any human pride could I answer to the gods for breaking these. Die I must, I know that well. How should I not, even without any edicts? But if I am to die before my time, I count that a gain. For when anyone lives as I do, compassed about with evils, can such an one find aught but gain in death? Messenger. This search at our despairing master's word we went to make, and in the furthest part of the tomb, we described her hanging by the neck, slung by a thread wrought halter of fine linen. While he was embracing her with arms thrown around her waist, bewailing the loss of his bride, who was with the dead, and his father's deeds, and his own ill-starred love. But the boy glared at Creon, his father, with fierce eyes, spat in his face, and without a word of answer, drew his cross-hilted sword. He straightway leaned with all his weight against his sword and drove it half its length into his side. And while sense lingered, he clasped the maiden to his faint embrace, and as he gasped, sent forth on her pale cheek the swift stream of the oozing blood. The Tragedy of King Lear, William Shakespeare, 1606. These are quotes from Acts 4 and 5. Lear, be your tears wet? Yes, faith, I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause, they have not. Cordelia, no cause, no cause. Leah, no, 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 come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court reviews. And we'll talk with them too. Who loses? Who wins? Who's in? who's out, and take upon the mystery of things as if we were God's spies, and will wear out in a wall prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Edmund, he hath commissioned from my wife and me to hang Cordelia in the prison, 
and to lay the blame upon her own despair that she forbid herself. Lear, and my poor fool Cordelia is hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? Though it come no more, never, 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 pray you, undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look on her. Look her lips. Look there. Look there. And Leah dies. The way of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. And the third is Aida, opera in four acts by Giuseppe Verdi, first performance in Cairo, 1871. Act four, scene two. The lower portion of the stage shows the vault in the temple of Vulcan. The upper portion represents the temple itself. Rodimus has been taken into the lower floor of the temple and sealed up in a dark vault. Thinking that he's alone and hoping that Aida is in a safer place, he hears a sigh and then sees Aida. She has hidden herself in the vault in order to die with Radimus. The duet, The Fatal Stone, now closes over me, is sung by Radimus and Aida. They accept their terrible fate as Radimus sings to die so pure and lovely and bid farewell to earth and its sorrows. Above the vault in the temple of Vulcan, Omniris weeps and prays to the goddess Isis. In the vault below, Aida dies in Radimus's arms, while the chorus sings prayers to the god. And now, the beautiful sadness. <laughs> 